Have you ever been in a situation where you're talking about a topic and you're conversing with a person and you're talking back and forth and then all of a sudden, maybe two to three or maybe even 10 minutes into that conversation, you realize that you have been talking about two entirely different topics. It's this idea of talking past each other. In a, in a evangelistic setting where you're talking with a person about Jesus, I've experienced this over and over and over and over, where you're talking to a person about God, and you think you're talking about the same thing, but in reality, you're not. And what we're going to talk about today is how do we effectively share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, how do we do that and not talk past the person that we're sharing with? How do we build a gospel bridge, if you will? How do we do that in a way that not only is clear to the hearer, but we're also truthful to scripture at the same time and led of the spirit? Well, Paul does something really cool in that in Acts 17 and 18. So let's dive in into Acts chapter 17 as he begins his second missionary journey. Now, again, Paul's second missionary journey, he's going all over the place. He's going to go through Thessalonica. He's going to make his way all the way to Greece. And you probably guys have a map uh, behind me. You have going all the way to Athens, and then you land in Corinth, and then he goes all the way back to Caesarea. Like, Paul travels a lot of miles by foot and on boat with his second missionary journey. And we're not even going to cover all of the second missionary journey because it's just too much. Like it bleeds over into Acts 19. And here where Paul starts, remember he was at Jerusalem at the council there. He goes back up to Antioch. And from Antioch, he launches out into his second journey, his second adventure, if you will, and then heads on to Thessalonica. So pick it up with me in verse 1 of chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now Thessalonica was the chief port of Macedonia, verse 2. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Now this is Paul's typical MO. He would visit a new place. He would find a synagogue where a bunch of Jews would gather for, for Sabbath worship. And he would go in there and he would tell them about Jesus. In verses four through nine, here's what happens. A lot of Jews believe, and not just Jews, a lot of devout Greeks believe, and a lot of influential ladies believe. There were people in that time where there were a lot of uh, well-to-do in society and in this particular case, a lot of the ladies in well-to-do society, they had extra time on their hands because they were wealthy. And what they would do is that they would focus on the political, on the arts, on the social, on the religious aspects of culture. And those gals end up getting saved in Thessalonica, which is pretty awesome because you have that, that influence. They now believe in Jesus. Before they might have been promoting Greek mythology, now they believe in Christ and they're promoting Jesus. But the Jews are incredibly jealous of Paul's success as a missionary. And you're going to see this theme over and over and over again, where the Jews are incredibly jealous of what God is doing. And we've talked about this before, and I'll be perfectly honest. We, we've talked this application point about jealousy and what God is doing with other people, and that we need to be careful of that. And full disclosure, full transparency, I, when I do a sermon prep, I, I was like, hey, Lord, is, is there anything in here that I need to fix? Is there anything in my life that I need to get right? And we did the jealousy thing twice, but then it was the third time where I was like, oh, there is something there, right? You guys ever been there? We're like, I'm fine. I'm fine. And all of a sudden, I'm not fine. <laughs> That's okay. Like God in his spirit and in his timing reveals those things to you. And so I had to repent of some things like as, as this jealousy thing came, comes up again. Because remember, ministry is about God. It's not about me or, or us. It's about the Lord. And what we want to do is that we want to say, you know what, God, if you're using somebody, then praise God. God, if you're using somebody in amazing ways, then I am excited for them. And a really good test, like what we said before, a really good test is, 
Can you pray for that person and not grit your teeth? Can you pray for that person that you're jealous of and not be upset? It's a really good check. And the, the key thing to that, Christian, especially for those of you called into ministry or leadership or servanthood of any kind, the key to that is recognizing who you really are and that ministry and being used by God is by grace for everybody anyways. It's not because we're better. It's not because we have it more together. God uses people by grace, or he couldn't use anyone. God uses people because he loves us and because of his grace. Now, the jealousy of the Jews get really violent here. Jason, which is one of the converts, is persecuted. The Jews claim that Paul and Silas are, are preaching to not worship Caesar, which is kind of true. But this was a big deal for the Jews to do. Number one, because the Roman Empire was very, very, um, very intense about making sure that you followed Caesar. They were very concerned about those kind of things. So all of a sudden, if you come in proclaiming there is another king, what does Rome do? They squash you. So this was the Jews' plan. They said, you know what? We need to squash Paul and Silas, so let's accuse them of this. Let's accuse them of rebellion and insurrection kind of stuff because they are saying that Jesus is the king. They are saying that, so let's just tell the Romans and then they'll kill them. That's the whole plan, right? So this is what happens. So the Jews do this and they say this phrase in the verses in verses four through nine. We're just gonna skim through this. And it says, the Jews speaking, these men have turned the world upside down and they now have come here also. Christian, when you go into your workplace, when you go to school, where you go with your friends or with your family, this sense from people that are not Christians is very true today. You come into a place and they're like, you, they, they will say this of Christians, Christian, you're messing everything up. Christians, if you simply weren't here, everything would be fine. You know what I'm saying? Christians, if you simply would go away, then our conscience would be cleared and we could just do whatever we wanted but we're bringing the message of the gospel and we're upsetting that balance by bringing truth into the situation. So Christian, just to let you know, like Paul dealt with that and so will you. And so they target Jason, the believer, uh, but they don't pay any attention to it. Like they just, it just goes on and on and on. And then all of a sudden Paul's like, we gotta go. <laughs> it's like, we totally gotta go. So they move on. Paul would later write first and second Thessalonians to this church that starts, even though it's a rocky start they get established as a church. Super exciting. So verse 10 of chapter 17. Now the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. And now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now noble is, is translated, they were being honest. They are more willing to be honest and examine where does the truth actually lead us? We're going to follow the truth wherever it happens to go. And what they did is that they searched the Old Testament scriptures because the New Testament wasn't written quite yet. They searched the Old Testament scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was really true. And the obvious application here is Christians, do you have that same tenacity to search the scriptures. These guys looked daily to see if what was being told them, what was being told to them about Jesus was true. Do we Christian, if a problem comes up or a situation arises, do we daily search the scriptures to determine, hey, is this what God is really doing? Is this really right? These are things that the Bereans did and they came to the conclusion, yes, Paul is right. And so therefore, many of them believed, and there were not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as the men that also believed. So again, verses 12 through 14 say, a ton of people believe, a lot of the influential people believed in the city. That's awesome. But what happened is that the Thessalonican Jews follow Paul to Berea, and they stir up the crowds again. There's another riot again. Could you imagine, like, Paul had people following him wanting to kill him all over the world. <laughs> He's like, this is, this is crazy. 
This happens again later. What happens is that they go to Berea, they stir up the same trouble, so Paul ends up leaving and goes to Athens. So pick it up with me, um, actually in 15 through, verses 15 through 20. Paul comes to Athens, and it's obviously the center of Greek art against uh, Greek philosophy, of Greek culture. And Paul is, sends for Silas and Timothy, and as he's walking around the city, he sees all the idols and all the statues for all the gods. And it says that Paul was provoked in his spirit. Paul was really bothered by this. He was really bothered by what was going on. And so Paul goes to the synagogue, as was his custom. And he also goes to the marketplace and he starts talking with people. And he runs into a lot of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And for those of you guys, for, for your gen eds in college, if you remember, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophy, this is what they would say. Epicureanism had a motto. See if it, re- see if it like hits some bells for you guys. Friends, freedom, and an analyzed life. Isn't that interesting? Now, the Stoics were all about virtue and living in harmony with nature. The Epicureanism, they st- thought that the gods don't really care about humanity if they're even there. And virtue is simply a means to an end. So you have the Stoics on one side that want to be virtuous and be in harmony with nature and with the world. And then you have the Epicureans on the other side. And this is all about the Greek philosophy back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What I find really interesting is that Epicureanism, at least the idea of it, is honestly really prevalent in American culture today. Friends, freedom, analyze life. In other words, it's all about friends, it's all about my rights, and thinking well. Not too far. And here what we find is that the Greek philosophers, they want to know what Paul is talking about. It's a new teaching. They have not heard about Jesus or about the the God of the Bible at all. And Paul gets summoned to Mars Hill, which is where they would all gather and they would hear what they had to say. And Paul, Paul gives this tremendous speech to these guys where we're going to read through it, where in effectively three minutes, he hits all points of Stoic philosophy and Epicureanism in one shot. Paul is pretty bright. He's pretty on top of things. Here is Paul's speech, and his goal is to share the gospel with these guys. But remember that these viewpoints that these guys hold are so far removed from Judaism. They're a polytheistic, pantheistic culture, whereas Judaism and Christianity is a monotheistic, you know, non-pantheistic culture. Huge worlds apart. And what has to happen is Paul has to build a bridge with these two cultures that are incredibly far away from each other. And this is how he does it. Pick it up in verse 21 of chapter 17. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They were always into the new thing, verse 22. And so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus. I don't know if I said that right. I apologize. Mars Hill, if you look it up, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Here's what the Greeks would do. They would set up a statue and they put unknown God. So that if there was a God that would come and say, hey, why didn't you build a statue for me? He's like, oh, we did. We just didn't know about you. So here's your statue, right? That's exactly what they would do. What Paul is saying is, hey, that unknown God that you don't know about, I'm going to tell you about him. So there's bridge number one. He connects that culture with, hey, I'm going to tell you about the God that I know, the God of the Bible. Verse 24, and the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. This God, this unknown God that you guys don't know about, created everything. He doesn't need a statue. He doesn't need a temple because everything is his to begin with. You don't need to do these kinds of things. And God created nature God is not nature. 
In other words, that pantheism idea. God is not the rock. God made the rocks. God is not the universe. God made the universe. And that shifts from an impersonal, pantheistic, nature-driven God to a personal, all-powerful God. Completely different mindset for them. Verse 26, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, which is Adam, as in Adam and Eve. Everybody came from Adam and Eve. Verse 27, That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from each one of us. To seek God, to seek a personal God, would be very different for them. God is a personal being, not a force. God is not far away because the gods were viewed as far away, off on Mount Olympus or wherever they would be. God is close. You see what he's doing here? Like he's taking these ideas and he's bringing them with biblical Christianity. And so Paul then quotes two of their actual own Greek uh, poets and philosophers. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Two quotes there. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. God is not his creation. God is over creation. I love how it says that we are his offspring, that we are all God's creation. But you know where Paul is going with this? God just doesn't want them to know that they're all part of God's creation. Paul wants them to know you can be part of God's family. That's where it's going to start to head, which is super cool how he's tying this together. Again, I look at this and just how masterful it's written and how masterful Paul's speech is. It's incredible. I wish I could speak like that. Verse 30. So this is what happens. But then being God's offspring, we ought not to think, oh, we read that, verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now, this is really important. If you've ever got a question from a person that says, hey, so Jesus came and died on the cross. What about all the people before that didn't believe in Jesus because Jesus wasn't even born yet and Jesus didn't die on the cross yet? Well, your answer is right here. Times of ignorance, God in his justice and mercy overlooked. It's like, whoa, that's wild. So here's what happens is that the people before Jesus, God, God looks at that injustice and mercy and says, I got it. I will take care of it because God is a God of justice and mercy, but he commands now that everyone turn away from sin and repent. In other words, you turn from the old ways and you turn to God. Verse 31, because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, which we'll find out is Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God will judge the world rightly and correctly. And that is not a popular thing, even in our culture. For their culture, that was completely new. The idea that one God, not, not a bunch of gods, but one God would have enough authority and enough power to, just, to judge everybody, to judge everything, and to do it correctly, not just try, but to actually do it. And this really comes down to something that is deep in our hearts that we don't I think in, in our culture, we don't necessarily say it this way or we phrase it this way, but all of us, to a degree, want justice, especially if we've been wronged. And I think what's happened is that we've, we've taken this idea that God is a judge and we've turned him out to be a mean person or a mean God, when in reality, God is looking at hurt and at pain and the consequences of sin and God is saying, I will make it right. I will fix this on the appointed day because I have the authority to do so. And if you've ever been in a, in a criminal case situation or you've ever been wronged by somebody or maybe you've been in a civil suit and there's that frustrating middle piece where you feel like justice is not being served. You feel like justice is not being done. God here is saying, one day, I will bring justice. It will be made right. 
that's to me is super encouraging because there's so many people that I know that they cry out for justice and sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't, but we can trust in the God that will deliver true, pure, loving justice because he's good. We, we, we cry out for justice and God will answer us. But God is also a God of grace and a God of mercy all at the same time. And the one day God will judge the world rightly and correctly. And to prove that God can have that authority to judge, he raised Jesus from the dead so that you know that he's the God of the living and also the God of the dead and the God of the afterlife. His control does not simply pertain to physical here. It's also in the supernatural world around us. And so verse 32, the resurrection is a big sticking point for Greeks because they don't buy it at all. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. Now, some didn't buy it. They're like, no. Some even made fun of Paul. They're on to the next new thing. Verse 33, so Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined and believed him. Among them were the were also Dionysus, the Acrobite, and the woman named Damaris, and others with them. So some believed. Like, it was not all for naught. Some believed in Paul's preaching here. And Paul goes from Athens at this point to a place called Corinth. So Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now Corinth was a merchant city. Corinth was bustling and prosperous and extremely decadent. If you want to think of a modern day equivalent to Corinth, I apologize if you're from the city, but it's true, Las Vegas, <laughs> okay? Corinth is the Las Vegas of the first century. It's a crazy city, very prosperous, very rich, a lot of sin. And this is where Paul goes. Verse two, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently came from Italy and his wife Priscilla, and because Claudius, which was the emperor at the time, commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, which by the way, for you history buffs, is an actual event that was recorded. So the Bible matches up with history. It's really cool. Verse three, and because, of, and because he was of the same trade as them, or as Priscilla and Aquila, he stayed with them for they were tent makers by trade. Now, interesting fact, Jewish rabbis were required to maintain some sort of trade. The Levite priests were completely dedicated to the work that they were supposed to do. But a rabbi, a teacher, or effectively a professor, or you could say a pastor, these rabbis, they had some trade that they maintained throughout their life. And so they were kind of split. They were bivocational. And I just want to encourage you guys, like for those of you that feel called to ministry, it's good to have a side hustle or tent making, just FYI. That's good to have, just in your back pocket. I can tell you that that has come extremely handy for me personally at Boise Church. It's really amazing. If you, if you don't have that, it's okay. Learn something, like find it. It's really helpful for you to be flexible in places that God would call you. It's really helpful. Verse four through six, it talks about how Paul reasoned in the synagogue on the Sabbath and the Jews were incredibly antagonistic towards Paul here. They did not like what he had to say whatsoever. And so he goes to the non-Jews of Corinth. He says, look, if you don't want to listen, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to the non-Jews. So verse 7, and he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, and his house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Super cool. So some Jews did believe, but the majority did not. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid. I want you to pause right there. We don't know what's going on through Paul's mind, but God speaks to Paul in a vision very clearly. And when God speaks pretty directly in this way, there's usually a very compelling reason. And I don't know if you could say that Paul was burnt out at this point. But if you go on to read, let's read the rest of the vision. It says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. God had to tell Paul this. I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city who are my people. 
Paul was afraid. He was scared. The Apostle Paul, who just stood in front of the Stoics and the Epicurean philosophers and all these things, is scared. What's he scared of? He's scared, well, if you see it's right there in the vision, he's scared of more suffering. He's scared of, am, am I going to last, God? Like, what, am I going to die? Like, is this it? Is this all that you have for me? Is it over? If you recount all the things that Paul has gone through up until this point, he has one more missionary journey. But if you recount everything that he's gone through, in the last five years, he's been mocked. He's been at the center of riots. He's been abandoned by friends. He's been beaten. People have followed him all around the world trying to kill him. He starts new churches and then more people show up and they try to kill him. He's been beaten with rocks to the point where he was basically dead or almost dead. And he was arrested and he's been thrown in jail. That's a pretty tough journey, <laughs> right? That's hard. And, I, and again, like Paul goes to Corinth and he gets fiercely rejected by the Jews. And then now he's kind of like, God, like, am I done? Like, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I'm afraid. And God's response is, do not be afraid. Keep preaching. You can't keep silent. Paul, you have to keep going. I have more for you. And I love that God echoes what Jesus says, I am with you. Just like the Great Commission, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Paul gets this specific revelation, I am with you. No one's going to attack you. I have a lot of people here, Paul. Corinth is a good place to be right now. Even though it doesn't look like it on the outside, just watch what happens. Keep preaching and keep watching what God is going to do. And I think that even in like a place like Vegas, there's people that follow the Lord, even in Vegas. Shocking, right? See, God wants us to move forward with him, even if we're afraid. I don't know what fear or what things you have in your life that you're anxious about or you're afraid of. But these promises are applicable to us today. Do not be afraid, and God is with you. Always. Even if it doesn't feel like it, God is with you. Always. You, even if things feel like they're falling apart, and they may be well falling apart, God is with you. Always. He will always be there. And so what does Paul do? I love this. So Paul stays, in verse 11, Paul stays a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. This is a city that he spends one of the, the longest times in. <laughs> He's like, hey, nobody's going to persecute me here. I'm going to stay for a long time, right? Like you would too, right? If God told you, uh, you're going to be fine here. I'm staying here. Like we're going to, we're going to do Bible study. We're going to plant churches. It's going to be great. I'm going to stay here. That's all right. No problem. And so verse 12, now, when Galileo was proconsul, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Now, for you Bible archaeology uh, buffs, um, I have a little picture here, Mark, if you want to bring that up. It's an actual inscription of, of Caesar, um, of Caesar uh, recommending Galileo, which is really cool. So it's actual inscription that they found. And you look at this, and it translates, Roman the Emperor Claudius, my friend and proconsul, Galileo. Just FYI. Right here in the book of Acts, you have an archaeological discovery that was discovered just in 2018. Just thought I'd throw that out there. The Bible is true, and you can trust it. And there's more to come, I'm sure. So again, the Jews are at it again, trying to get Paul in trouble. Verse 13, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. And Galileo is like, guys, this is a Jewish thing. Like you guys are arguing about stuff that I don't care about. You figure it out. He's not a very good leader. He just kind of kicks it back to, to the Jews. And Galileo doesn't really do anything about it. So Paul ends up leaving. Verse 18, now after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with them Priscilla and Aquila, the, the tent maker duo that he discovered and met. 
And at, and at Kenshre, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Now, we don't know what kind of vow this was, probably a Nazarite vow, because Nazarites, as we learned in the book of Judges, you let your hair grow long, so he cut his hair. And then in 19 through 23, an act of uh, verses 19 through 23, Paul goes to a Jewish synagogue in Ephesus. And it's just a little blip, and we're going to learn more about Ephesus in Acts 19 and 20. But a church starts in Ephesus, and he doesn't stay there long. He's actually on his way to go back through Galatia and Phrygia and encourage the churches there. But in verse 24, we have something that's really cool. We have Priscilla and Aquila, who are converts, if you will, other Christians, and we start to see the ministry of God spreading, where other people are also being used by God in awesome ways. So pick it up with me in verse 24. Now there was a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, and he came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. Now Alexandria is in Egypt, and that is the same place where the Alexandrian library was kept for you history buffs. It was all the books over all the world. Unfortunately, it was destroyed, but it still was a center of academia and, and education. And Apollos grew up there. And he was eloquent and he knew his Bible. And Alexandria still had a large Jewish population in the first century. So this is not a surprise at all. And so uh, Priscilla and Aquila run into this guy, verse 25. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. He was fervent, he was accurate, minus what was happening later. He was eloquent, he was a great speaker. What was missing? The, the, the baptism of John was baptism of repentance for remission of sin. In other words, turn to God and, and your sins will be forgiven and, and be baptized. What was missing was Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And so what Priscilla and Quilla do, verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, just like Paul. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They said, hey, you have everything right. Here's how the story ends, Apollos. Jesus went he died on the cross. He's the ultimate sacrifice to pay for everything we've done wrong. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And Apollos is like, whoa, that is cool, right? I, I don't know if he said that, but you know what I'm saying. Like, I'm paraphrasing the story for you. He totally receives the full gospel. And then Apollos becomes an invaluable part of the team at Ephesus and the surrounding region that he was a force to be reckoned with when it came to ministry and when it came to preaching the gospel. And I love the fact that Priscilla and Aquila, they took the time to, to help this guy along. They took the time to say, hey, you have everything right, but you're missing a couple of key things. They took the time, they pulled him aside, and here's the thing about Apollos. He doesn't know Priscilla or Aquila from anybody. And what did he do? When he heard the truth, he received it. He said, okay. He changed what he was teaching. He changed his message. And he became part of what God was doing in Ephesus and the surrounding regions. So a couple application points. Number one, the Bereans were really awesome. They searched the scriptures daily. And whenever somebody says anything about the Bible or about spiritual things, or even if I say something about the Bible or spiritual things, you need to ask yourself the question, is that really in the Bible? Be like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily. Now, I have a couple of things you know, to test you guys if this is really a Bible verse or not. So you don't have to, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because, you know, you might get it wrong and I love you guys. So just answer it in your head, okay? And then keep mental score. That was um, three wise men. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? No, there were three gifts, but not three wise men, right? So there's, there's one. Was it an apple in the Garden of Eden? We don't know, right? We, it was just some fruit. It's like, or how about this verse? God helps those who helps themselves. No, that's not in the Bible either. Or how about this one? Money is the root of all evil. Close. It's actually one of Paul's epistles. It says the love of money 
is the root of all evil. Is that really in the Bible? God will not give you more than you can handle. Is that in the Bible? I hate to break it to you, but that's actually not a Bible verse. Now, let's break apart that idea. Now, Paul couldn't even handle it in this chapter. Paul had to get a vision from God in order to keep going. Paul had to get inspiration from God to keep moving forward. And there's countless other examples with Elijah, with Abraham. The more appropriate way to say it is when God is with you, you can handle a lot more than you think. When God is with you, you can handle a lot more than you think. That's the more appropriate thing. When a pastor or a preacher or a Christian or anyone says, oh yeah, that's in the Bible, is that really in the Bible? Check. Even check me. Like Check that what I'm saying is truly scriptural, is truly biblical. I, I Seriously. Because I want the truth to encourage and build you up. Lies and, and falsehoods do not build the church up at all. Truth with love builds the church up. That's what we want to go after. So really ask that. Is that in the Bible? Whatever you're listening to or whoever talk, you're talking with, is that really in the scriptures? And like Bereans, daily search the scriptures to see if that is true. I'll tell you, starting a church, which is super exciting, like I'm still on cloud nine with, with, with doing church and starting a church. I love it. I absolutely love it. If you can't tell. There were so many things and so many topics that would come up when we would talk with our team and they would say, what do we do? And I would be like, I don't know. I got to go check my Bible, right? <laughs> so like, I got to go, I got to go look. And that's, that's a good thing. We want to look there. I can't tell you how many times where I've said, what does the Bible say? Or what is the, what does scripture say on this topic? Those are the kinds of things that we want to be. Second application point. Jesus is with you always. And even Paul needed that encouragement. Even Paul needed that inspiration. God is with you always, even if it doesn't feel like it. Again, Christian, I want to, this, is, this is meant to be encouraging. When our feelings contradict what we know to be true, it's time to say, you know what? I'm going to hold fast to truth because my feelings are lying to me right now. Truth is more important than our feelings. Are feelings important? Yes. Are emotions important? Absolutely. 100%. But as Christians, if our feelings contradict truth, Christian, that's the signal to hold fast to truth and don't let go. That's the signal to lean into God and what he has for you into truth. Again, feelings are important. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking feelings. But truth is more important than what we feel. It really is. Because feel, big surprise, our feelings lie to us. <gasps> Whoa, shocker, right? That does happen. See, God wants us to be followers of truth, with love and truth. And then last application point, and then we'll wrap this up. When you talk with people about Jesus, just like what Paul did with Athens, Paul recognized a couple of things in Athens. He recognized they have no concept of the law, of the Mosaic law. They have no concept of why animal sacrifice even exists. They have no concept of a monotheistic God that created the world. They have no, you, know, you see how like far apart their thinking and, and their worldview is? It's incredibly far apart. So what did Paul do? Paul used the culture of the day and he looked for connections to build a bridge to the gospel. At the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there was not a lot of bridge building that was needed. You want to know why? Because at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, it was a bunch of Jews from all over the world. They understood the animal sacrifice system. They understood sin. They understood the holiness of God. They understood that it was God that created everything. They understood that God could forgive sin. They understood that there was a coming Messiah that was going to make everything right and be the hero of humanity. They understood all of that. What Peter did in the power of the Spirit is, here he is. His name is Jesus. That's the hero. And they believed. Here in Greece, 
They have none of that context. They have none of those things. And so what do they do? You build a bridge. You start with the ideas and culture that they're familiar with, and you build a gospel bridge. This passage was really instrumental in changing, well, a lot of things in my life personally. I was a youth pastor for many years in Tucson, Arizona. And one of the things that, that we would do, it was our first year doing it back in 2017. We would do school outreaches. We would, uh, the Bible club would put together a lunch and they would feed the whole school and, and churches would sponsor that. And hey, when you have 300 Chick-fil-A sandwiches in your car, it smells the best thing ever, right? It's so good, right? So we would feed the whole school. And these students would share their testimonies in front of 200 students in the band room. No lights, no fog, no haze, no pad music, no nothing. Just pure, unadulterated, this is what Jesus did in my life in front of their 200 peers. And on Friday, they asked me to share, why does a good God allow suffering in this world and you have nine minutes? And I thought, Challenge accepted, right? <laughs> I was like, okay, Lord, like, this is what we're going to do. Like, this is what we're going to do. I really didn't know what to say because I was struggling with this idea that I'm talking, I'm not talking to a bunch of church kids. I'm talking to a bunch of people that have no concept, no context. They're postmodern Christian type people. They don't, they're not even close. You know, they get offended that you say the word sin right? You're in that environment. So I'm thinking, Lord, how in the world do I do this? And I listened to a teaching on Acts 17 and 18, and it was on this topic, and it completely changed my life. And it was because in terms of how I relate to people and how I share the gospel with people. And this is something that God wants you to do as well, to recognize who you're sharing with and how you can build a gospel bridge. So I'll give you an example back to that Bible club outreach in 2017. I thought, okay, Lord, how do I build this, this cultural bridge? What are students and teenagers, like what are they all about right now that I could connect with at a gospel level? And I thought, oh, feelings. That's easy, right? <laughs> it's like, let's go with that. And what I, as God like worked out the, the, the sermon prep, it was totally God, guys. And again, the power is not in the eloquence of words. The power is in the spirit and what he's doing to change hearts. What I was simply doing was there's no misunderstanding as who Jesus is and how they can understand that. The decision point is very clear for them. And with the feelings and with the emotions that students are feeling, a lot of them feel wronged and they want justice or they feel like sin is not a big deal. And what I would say is like, hey, pain, when you feel pain, it's an indicator that there is something wrong. You feel pain in your knee, there might be something wrong. You feel pain you know, in your arm because you just injured it in a game, there's something wrong. You injured it. And you have to ask the question, why is this world full of pain? It's because there is something wrong. Because sin hurts. Sin really does hurt people. It, you know, and then obviously it offends God and all those things. But as I'm sharing with these students, like you could hurt a pin drop because they never thought of sin in that way. They thought of sin as something that the big guy upstairs wants to ruin all their fun. They thought the big guy upstairs was ruining all their plans for the weekend. It's like, no, sin hurts. And if this world is full of pain and this world is full of suffering, and if God created this world, then you know what? Maybe if God is the creator of this universe and God is the creator of this world, and I want justice for my pain, and I want justice for all the wrong things done to me, and I want justice for all the wrong things done for other people, if God created this world and he made this mess, then maybe God should pay. And you see the bridge starting to form. He did pay. 
His son Jesus on the cross paid for all the sins of all the pain and all the hurt for the entire world, even though he did nothing wrong, and even though it was not his fault, we chose sin. We chose to hurt people. But God freely offers you the gift of eternal life. That's why Jesus came. That's the whole point. And Jesus wants to come into your life, into your heart. You see how that bridge like was built? And I'll tell you, like, so cool, like totally what God did. There were 12 students that got up in front of the crowd of 200, 12 students, not church kids, that got up and stood and came forward and gave their life to Christ on the spot. And that was a spiritual shockwave through that high school. There was like, what just happened? I was like, oh, God is moving. That's what happens. And it was like, right? And I'm still blown. I still like, my mind is blown by those things. Where God can do that even today. God can do those kind of things even with your coworkers and with the people at school. Do not underestimate the simplicity of the gospel when it reaches people's hearts because God is moving in ways that you never could even dream of. How do you build those bridges? Really pray about that this week. How do I build the bridge with that friend? How do I build the bridge with my atheist coworker? How do I build the bridge with my Mormon boss? How do I build the bridge with a former Christian that doesn't go to church anymore because they have been burned by church? How do I, how do I build that bridge? See, God will give you the wisdom. God will give you the, the right words to say. Really pray and say, God, like, how do I build this bridge for the gospel? There's so many people, they don't even know what sin is. They don't even know God. They don't know that he loves them. They don't know that he died for them, that he went to that length to to pay for all of the wrong that they've done. They're not even there. So as Christians in this world, what do we do? We build a bridge for the gospel. And the Holy Spirit changes the hearts in ways that we can never do. We want to be able to build a bridge so that the person has a clear choice. Do you want Jesus to forgive you and follow him or not? Do you want Jesus to to be Lord of your life or not? See, we want to build that bridge of the gospel and bring it to a decision point. And again, that may take a couple of days, that may take a couple of months, and I know some of you don't want to hear this, but that might take a few years. But continue to build that bridge and, and build those relationships and see what God can do when you see and listen to where they're at and start to make those connections with the gospel today. Amen? Let's all stand. And let's take communion together.